Got some less than the desirable news by a long ways. So, you remember in the last video, we were playing on the sandbars on my way to Kansas. First stop, I noticed I had an oil leak and uh, pulled the cowl, checked it out, couldn't find it. Wasn't leaking bad, wasn't down on oil. Decided to press on. At first, I thought, oh, I might have just overfilled it and it's blowing out a little bit. Um, Rotaxes will do that sometimes if you overfill them, although this one's never been that way. But anyway, pushed on, kept, kept uh, pulling the cowl, checking the oil. Uh, wasn't losing that much, so I just thought, well, I'll get through uh, the weekend and get on home. Had some fun, and then topped it off before I took off for home. It was just barely down. But anyway, long story short, I got it home. That was yesterday. I got back, and last night I figured out uh, what it was. I cleaned up all the oil and did some short runs until I pinpointed where it was coming out. And finally, I just had it running. I could see it actually leaking. And it's bad news, the case is cracked, and it's in a really weird spot, although I talked to Jason from Edge, and he's seen pictures of other ones cracked in this area. Um, it's on the back side of the flange here. So the engine halves mate together, and on the engine case itself, it forms this flange that the gearbox bolts to, okay? On the back side, it's probably hard to see, if you're looking right down in there, there's a little bit of a gray line. Tip of my finger. See that little gray line right there? That line has kind of got a darker color to it because it's got a little bit of oil residue right there. But it's on the it's on the vertical, you know, part of this. It's not not down on the you know the flat part of the case. It's actually on the upright part of the case at the top of where that little gray line was. There's a hairline crack. You can't even see the crack, but when it's running, you can see oil actually bubbling out through that crack. And so, anyway, it's, uh, hey, you can kind of see it through there, kind of, sort of, but uh, it's bad news. The airplane was finished in beginning of 17 or end of 16, but the engine is older, and um, it's not a through bolt case, not a heavy case. And these older cases had trouble, even at stock power. And you know, I haven't really turned it up uh, much. You know, the exhaust setup I made for it made uh, a little bit more power. And then the fuel injection setup, I had tuned it to just make a little bit more power. Between those two mods, and I, you know, I picked up somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 200 RPM. But so I hadn't, I hadn't cranked it way up or anything. It wasn't a, uh, didn't blow up due to power. You know, I was running running around stock boosts or just slightly higher and then you know with it breathing a little better so and I wasn't lugging or anything I had it turned up to where in a climb at full power I was pretty much right at the red line so so it's just one of those things an old crappy case this is what they do and uh, I'm pretty bummed because I knew this was coming I mean I was already planning on getting a uh, building up a, a heavy case through bolt case motor with a welded crank so I could make more power down the road anyway That was always the plan, but I thought this thing would get me a year or two uh, I'm just really bummed man. I had big plans to go to Idaho this year. That's coming up around the corner and Some other cool flying that was gonna go on and it's just I've been working so hard on it putting a ton of money and energy into it and I was just really getting it all together you know, it was just coming together Took its first big trip out there to Kansas and Oklahoma, and it performed so well. And I thought, man, this thing is going to be such a blast this summer. And then, boom, <laughs> here we are. This is going to cost dearly. There's no cheap way to fix this. To get a hold of a newer case, your options are eh, pretty much buying a brand new case or a new short half or a new engine. There's not a lot of used good cases out there of the newer style, so I'm pretty uh, pretty much screwed money-wise. I've been talking with Jason and um, looking at my options, and he's he's already jumped on it and trying to figure out what he what we can do. He's looking at uh, 
how we can get a hold of a case or maybe just like a bottom end, you know, full rotating assembly. It might be all new. And um, and then he's gonna he's gonna weld the crank and we're gonna do oil squirters and a ULS cam and some of those things that don't cost a ton extra to do at the time. You gotta do it right because if we don't do it right, we'll just be back here again. In some aspects it'll be good. You know, I had to be real careful. I didn't lug this motor. Um, which meant that under full power, even in a steep climb, my RPM was like, you know, right at red line. Um, but with the tougher case, you know, you make a little more power, you have to add a little more pitch, which means it's going to lug a little bit more when you're cruising, but it's not such a big deal because the motor can handle it. So there's a lot of things that will come out of this will be better. It's just that, man, it's a lot of money, and I was really hoping to put this off till at least after summer and fall. But there's nothing like flying, so you got to do whatever it takes to get back in the air, right? Came off a little before I was ready there. And I'm pretty positive this camera won't pick it up because it won't focus in this close, but it took me a while to even see it by eye. Cleaned everything real good. Right there at the tip of my finger, like where my fingernail is, um, running right across there. It's cracked, and I think it goes on up because it was leaking. Where it was leaking on the back of the case was up there, like where the tip of my finger is. So obviously the crack must run up there, but where I could actually see it, was down right across here, and that's right where the head stud goes through. So, um, yeah, I can see the crack there pretty good. Damn, that's crazy. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. These older blocks do this. Okay, guys, just working away here on getting this engine out, and I wanted to touch on something. This is a follow-up from my earlier edge fuel injection install videos. If you remember, I was complaining about how hard it is to get these Allen bolts in on the inside of the intake manifold, and it was tough, and I had to cut off some little Allen wrenches and try to do some stuff, and it was still a real pain. And uh, I hadn't even thought about it, and I know better. I know these tools exist. I hadn't even thought about it until uh, Thomas had pointed out to get something along these lines, okay? So this is a five millimeter, um, you know, Allen T handle. You can get them with a screwdriver handle or whatever. But anyway, I just brought, you know, I had bought this a while back just so I'd have it, and now I'm using it, of course. And I was able to get in here and pop all four of these loose and spin them out, you know, to basically get them all the way out without even having to do anything by hand. And it just made my life a lot easier pulling this part. So I just wanted to mention that um, for what it's worth, if anybody's following along all this stuff and uh, is considering the fuel injection. I also want to mention, since we're stopped and talking about things along these lines, I've just been working with Thomas and Jason both uh, regarding what I'm going to do here. And they have been absolutely phenomenal in moving quickly to come up with a solution to get parts to, um, you know, trade back some of the good parts off this engine and working deals and just reaching out and, you know, finding the parts I need. And at this point, nothing's for sure here, but I might be not only doing a new heavy duty through bolt case with a welded crank and uh, a bigger aftermarket turbo cam, that's for sure. But I might be working a deal to get some new ULS uh, cylinders and their shims. Edge has shims so that you can run the 10.5 to 1 compression ULS cylinders at, and it bumps it back down to 9 to 1 or 8.5 to 1 or whatever it is. Don't quote me off the top of my head, but it obviously lowers the compression down to a friendly, to a turbo, you know, a boost friendly compression ratio. And the advantage to doing that is, you know, Rotax cylinders are really are really good. They have an extremely long life, really don't wear out, 
and typically don't use any oil to speak of. And so it's a, an affordable solution to maintain all of those positive features and get a little more displacement and have the right compression ratio. Obviously, aftermarket, you know, edge, big bore cylinders have a lot of advantages and they have their place for doing certain things. But in this case with Boost, that's a hard combination to beat for the money. So I'm, I'm going to try to swing that if I can afford it. I'm just making some progress here, pulling apart. And as you can see, even this old motor with some fair time on it and making above stock power and everything. And cylinders look brand new, you know, cross hatching is perfect. I had to run it on Avgas. I think it's the first time it's ever seen Avgas on this last trip on the way home, mostly. And so, of course, there's a little bit of lead carbon on there. But otherwise, you know, the thing is, is in good shape. I guess the good news is I can sell these pistons and cylinders because the, they all had good leak down results and you can tell there's no wear. I'm, I'm assuming the rest will look like this. Obviously I'll check, but might be able to get a little something out of that, which is good. So working these wrist pins out so that I can keep the pistons just stuck in the barrels uh, can be a little bit of a pain. Um, and one thing that helps really good, and I have to give credit to my old man for this because he's the one that taught me this is, you uh the wrist pin doesn't want to push out like by hand then warm up the piston with a heat gun you know you don't have to go get carried away but just get it toasty nice and warm and uh and then usually the wrist pins will just pop right out if they still won't go um it turns out that one of the head studs and a and one of the nuts from the head studs will actually fit through uh that wrist pin bore, you know, without scraping on anything. And you can pop this through and stick a nut on it and then tug them out of there with that. I was gonna film taking the motor off, but I had to change my plan. Originally, I was gonna leave the ring mount on, as I was saying earlier, and then pull the motor out of the ring mount. But, turns out that the water lines on this side catch on the mount and wouldn't let it out. And I didn't realize that until I was holding the motor up, trying to get it out of there, so I had to Suspend the turbo so that I didn't have to take the cable off. That worked out pretty good. Got it out of the way. And uh, and then just pulled it off. It ended up not being too big a deal. I took the radiator mount sports off. This radiator had been mounted in there crooked and always bothered me. So I remade the, the mount back behind here and got it to lay, uh, lay down flat instead of being crooked. So, but anyway, I can pull the water pump, pull the stator housing, you know, pull the flywheel and everything get my electronics off of here and my ignition because I need that for the new motor and uh, you know get a few things off here that I need then split the case get that crank out for him and then once I get all that done I'm pretty well you know uh, caught up on my part waiting for the engine which uh, I don't want to make it sound like that's some kind of negative like I'm standing around waiting those guys are those guys are moving on all this super fast like I say I think I touched on this earlier it's been a couple days since I filmed but they were uh, they were freaking killing it on getting me going here. I, I like I say I can't thank them enough, man. They didn't have to to jump to action and start sourcing parts and coming up with a plan and figuring out how we could do this as economical as possible. But uh, they've really come through and surprised me with um, what we're going to be able to put together here for the money. It's freaking awesome, um, and I mean it's going to take every dime I have, but. We got to do it right or I'll be back in here doing it again. And um, if I can get this thing running and it's done right, then hopefully I can, you know, catch up money-wise as time goes on. I'm not dumping more into it for a while. So anyway, big thanks to them, Edge. Um, you know, like I said, Jason, the uh, North American distributor, and, and Thomas, the uh, owner of Edge, they have just been freaking helping me out big time. And I look forward to, you know, continually working with them on future projects like this intercooler design that we're, we're working on and some of that other stuff. So we can get this button back up so we can work on that. Because really what will happen is I'll be limited on power by, um, the, you know, not having an intercooler or how well this intercooler works. Um, so this motor, I'll have the ULS pistons, you know, so bigger, bigger bores, more displacement and that bigger cam between the two of those is going to make um 
it would make the same power at a lot less boost or it would make more power at the same boost, however you want to look at it. Now, it's not quite as good as it sounds like intercooler wise because that turbo still having to flow X amount of air to make X amount of power. It's just doing it at a lower boost setting. Boost is a measurement of resistance. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. They ask you, oh, how much boost are you running? Well, it, you know, that doesn't mean anything unless you know the size of the turbo, what cam shaft you got, head work, you know, cylinder size, displacement, all those things. So it's a measurement of resistance. And so essentially we'll be able to make the same power at a lower boost because there's less resistance to the engine breathing, you know, both getting air in and getting exhaust out. So um, all that comes into play. So anyway, the, uh, the turbo in a sense won't have to work quite as hard but it's still gonna make plenty of heat, it's still gonna need an intercooler. So, you know, I might be able to make more power without an intercooler, uh, theoretically. And hopefully this small intercooler deal that we're working on will be enough. So I'm kind of shooting for going like to uh, 915 power, get up around that 140 horse or a little more, since they tend to make a little more than that. And uh, at this altitude, okay? Now that's conservative number because this engine will be built to take the 155, maybe more. Um, but I'd like to stay conservative. I was trying to do that before. Of course, that didn't get me very far. Here we are. But in theory, if I do it like that, this engine will last, you know, obviously a long time. And it allows me to do one other thing, and that is this. If I set this thing up to make 140 horsepower at this altitude, and I set my prop pitch, okay, to work with that amount of power, when I go down in altitude, I lose a ton of RPM. When I was in Kansas here on that last uh, video, on that last trip, uh, I lost like 300 RPM because the thicker air is dragging that prop down, but I'm not making any more power. In fact, I actually had the boost turned down down there a little bit, um, and there's a whole reason for that. I won't get into all of it, but so I lost a bunch of RPM. So my thought process is this. Up at this altitude, in order to make 155 horsepower, I would need a really good intercooler because that turbo is working extra hard up here. So it may not happen. Um, if I can get up around 135, 140, then when I go down in altitude, the, the change in atmospheric pressure will actually give me more horsepower without the turbo essentially working any harder, and the boost will come up, or the overall pressure will come up. It's not actually the boost causing it, but it will make more power. That will help offset the RPM loss from being down there in that thick air. It's really grabbing that prop. So it might all kind of work out and be a pretty good setup where, yeah, I still lose power, quote unquote, as I come up in altitude, uh, at least up to here, but it offsets the RPM, it might be worth doing, and it's not that big a deal. It'll make plenty up here, it'll make even more down there. It's pretty much a win-win. Um, and I'll set the tune to where as I go up, I can maintain power as long as the intercooler can handle it. Essentially, that's what I'm gonna be tuning around is intake air temperature. Uh, since I'm not as restricted on what the engine can handle, with this new setup, I'll be able to tune more on just safe intake air temperatures with whatever we end up doing for an intercooler setup. Okay, so I'm trying to cut, I'm trying to make a, uh, a puller tool for my Rotax for the flywheel and the uh, sprag housing. And last time I had borrowed one when I did a sprag. And uh, I didn't want to have to borrow one again. I don't like doing that kind of stuff. But they're like $180 or some ridiculous thing to buy. So I had to recruit the old man because this is a little bit beyond me cutting these metric threads. But uh, So I've got an old flywheel here so we could get the threads off of it. And uh, we're going to set up the lathe to cut those inside metric threads. And then we can put a plate over the end or something and cut and and tap that for just a regular old bolt to actually do the pushing. So anyway, that's what I'm working on right now. So we've got to change some gears back here, or at least one gear, to get to the right metric thread per inch. That's why we're doing this, right? Yep. Right. I don't do it very often. Yeah, it's been a while. I say I've only ever cut uh, American threads, so I never had to do anything like this. I think you just helped me kind of figure out the chart. And I just ran the lathe back and forth or whatever. It was pretty easy. So doing metric kind of throws us a little curveball here. So yeah, I can do quite a bit of stuff with, you know, a lathe or a mill, but I'm no machinist. So I got to recruit dad every now and then to help me with this. I don't do, do a lot of threading, but it was interesting. He was just telling me these other lathes he has. So to give you an idea, you know, I'm a pretty, pretty big, tall guy. And that's my hand versus the 
head on that lathe, okay? So this thing's pretty massive. But these other lathes you have only do American threads. So the little one over there that we're working on is the only one he has the gears that'll do metric threads. I thought that was kind of interesting. I didn't realize that. The cool thing about this lathe is he added a transmission, a motorcycle transmission, so that he can, you know, have a lot more speeds. So, like, when you're cutting aluminum, you know, gear it way up. You're cutting steel like this, and gear it way down, and that gave him a lot more quick adjustments. Okay, right, so here we go. Ready? Yep. Uh, okay. So we put that on there like that, and we try to line it up like that. Yeah. That's yeah. a good fit. There it goes. Okay. All right. Okay, so now, and then you throw it up on there, and there's no slop. Yeah, we're, that's all the threads you got. Okay, good. We got it. All right, back over the hanger here. Uh, sorry my camera died when I was finishing making this thing the other day. But uh, there's there's the uh, kind of finished product welded up and everything. This is an old flywheel. I was just testing it out on, you know, to get the threads. It is moment of truth here. Maybe I'll actually show in the video what just happened there. Anyway, all right, here we go. For real, moment of truth. See what happens. <clears throat> Ooh. Wow. Okay, yes, this might be just a little overkill. There it went. At least I think. Yep. Okay. Dang. Well, I've never had one come off that hard. Not to say that it doesn't happen. Well, it's never happened to me. I've had them had a couple of these off over the years. Man, that was a Son of a gun. But my tool worked. That's good. Threads look good. Didn't hurt anything. Uh, put a little grease on that bolt so it looks like it survived, although I ordered a new one. But it's out of stock along with everything else I ever order from Aircraft Spruce or CPS. What do you think about doing a full edge build? You think that's the way to go? Do you? Oh, oh, we're excited about that idea. Okay, so I screwed up and bought a non-deep 46 millimeter socket. Didn't even realize it until I went over there to pull that thing off. So rather than wait and buy another one and spend more money and wait another three to five days or whatever, um, I thought, hey, we'll just lengthen this one. So I just put it in the chop saw, chopped it in half, and then I'll make a piece of pipe and put in the middle and square it up and weld it up and then I'll have a deep socket. And yes, it won't technically be as strong as it was, but it doesn't matter. Okay, I just got it tacked up here, uh, both pieces. Got it pretty squared up, so I'm gonna go ahead and burn it on there and uh, hopefully this will work. Well, there it is. I'm gonna twist on it a little bit. There ain't a whole lot to hang on to here is the problem. If you yeah. can get a hold of this somehow and let's see what the hell happens here oh you okay yep okay this comes off anything like the flywheel did it's gonna be a pop eh? now i've got a bigger pipe range or a crescent i go get it something was happening but there it goes well, i think it i think it happened something happened i don't know if it was good or bad Oh yeah, I think it's going to happen. Okay. There's that. Now, there's the sprag. I'll have to take it apart. That's your starter sprag, right? Yep.
Look at those bearing surfaces. This one, the bearing came out with it here. Let's pop that off. These two, the bearing stayed on the block half. And uh, interesting. This is the first time I've had a bottom end of a Rotex apart. The actual surfaces of the crank look good to me. Now I'm not obviously I haven't put a haven't mic'd them or anything like that, and I'm probably not going to do anything more elaborate. Visually, I don't see anything alarming at all. Everything looks good, so I'll just send it off to Thomas. Let me pop this sucker out of here. There it goes. The other two rods are hanging. That'll work. All right, well, there's the crank. And uh, looks like, yeah, I can slide the freewheel gear off, so I'll do that and ask them if I need to keep that gear that drives the gearbox. But anyway, it looks good. No scratches. I can't feel anything, and they're smooth and clean. The surfaces all look good. And you can see why these things crack. I mean, there's nothing here. You can pick one of these up with one finger, you know, trying to make it as light as they can. And they were a little too light, so the new ones are a little beefier, of course. But anyway, that's the look inside of a Rotex engine. All right, guys, we'll probably end that video here. Uh, no, it's not the most exciting thing, but uh, hopefully you guys found something kind of interesting getting to see inside of one of these engines and look around a little bit. And hopefully I'll have another video here in a couple weeks with maybe some updates. Might have an engine or, you know, see what's going on. Again, uh, big thanks to uh, Edge Performance. Um, Thomas, thank you. Jason, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll be back with you guys soon. So thanks for watching. Uh, subscribe if you haven't. Check out some of my other content. I actually have some pretty fun flying stuff. Not all just boring stuff like this in the hangar. And uh, see you guys on the next one. Okay, I just messaged Jason, asked him about that uh, the, the gear that drives the gearbox. And, you know, I had read this somewhere, and at one point, I guess, and totally forgot. But uh, he reminded me that gear is matched to the gear that it drives in the gearbox. So I got to pull that nut. And, uh, and get that gear off the crank before I can send it back. So anyway, thanks for letting me know, Jason, before I went any further, I'll get that done. So, all right, guys, that's it. Uh, I'm out of here. Have a good one.